Thank you so much for coming out and joining us. There's a traditional way of celebrating Easter where someone from the stage says, he is risen, and you guys respond with, all right, very good, let's try it one more time. He is risen. Amen to that. I was in the shower this morning getting ready. I was like, man, I was so excited about Jesus and his resurrection. And as I was showering, I was like, man, we got to make this day more about Jesus than what it is. And I was like, you know, the whole hiding the eggs thing, like how can we redeem that for Jesus, putting candy and eggs and hiding? I was like, you know what, this is what we should do. My kids don't know about this yet because it just happened this morning in the shower. So it's a brilliant idea. Well, I'm going to test on you guys. If you think it's good, you can give me a thumbs up. If you don't like it, give me a thumbs down. But I'm like, why don't we break the eggs in half and make it look like a tomb, right? And then all the kids put a piece of candy in it, and then they put tin foil over that looks like a stone, right? And then they go hide it. But when they find it in the backyard and they roll away the stone, there's no candy in there. It's empty. It's gone. And when they ask me, where is it? The tomb is empty. I'll say, it has arisen to glory and has become one with the Father. (laughs) Perfect unity with the Father. Yeah? Yeah, I got (laughs) I like it. Thank you. Uh, I got some booze from the kids. Okay, not a good idea. Uh, I, okay, if you don't know me, my name's Keith. I'm one of the pastors here. That was all a joke, okay? I, I don't eat my kids. Can- well, I do eat my kids' candy, but I wouldn't eat all their candy. I would uh, just eat a little bit of their candy. Um, but man, I am excited to celebrate Easter for us as believers in Jesus Christ who ch- claim the gospel has changed our life. This is a big Sunday of celebration, and I'm so glad it's a packed house. It only feels right for it to be a packed house as we give God the worship and the glory he deserves. If you're new with us, thank you for joining us. We're in the middle of a series through the book of Psalms, 14 different Psalms helping us learn how to worship God, how to use the Psalms to aid us on our worship journey. And this morning, as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, we're going to be looking at Psalm 16. Now, if you know your Bibles well, it could be a little confusing to say, why are we going to Psalms to preach about the resurrection of Christ? Because the book of Psalms was completed thousands of years, or at least a thousand years, before Jesus even walked on the face of the earth? Well, that's a good question. And hopefully you'll soon pick out why I picked Psalm 16 to preach through for Resurrection Sunday and to give credit where credit is due. This was not my idea. There's two apostles, Peter and Paul, who both picked Psalm 16 to preach about the resurrection of Christ. So I got it from them. But before we move forward, kids, do you guys all have that little piece of paper that has 10 different words on it? Ushers, if you guys can be ready for this. Kids, if you don't have, do we, ushers, do we still have extra papers? Yeah. So kids, if you don't have one of those little papers, you can raise your hand and an usher will get you a a piece of paper. We got a couple up here. Um, But what the idea with this little piece of paper, there's 10 words on it, and we really want you to pay attention this morning. We believe God has something for you in this sermon. So the way it works is as soon as I say one of these 10 words, you circle that, and then you're done with that word. You can move on to the non-circled words. And let's see if you can catch me saying in the sermon all 10 of those words, all right? Adults, if you're struggling to pay attention to, you can also get a piece of paper and see if you you can track along, all right? Excellent. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 16. We're going to be reading verses 8 through 11 this morning. And out of reverence and respect for Scripture, can we stand for the reading? Psalm 16, starting at verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Shiloh or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And God, we thank you for your scripture. We thank you for your word. 
And I pray that we would handle it with reverence and sincerity as we look at your resurrection and understand what the resurrection of Christ means to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. I read out of the ESV. Um, I'm, all, I'm going to be preaching out of the NLT. I feel like the NLT handles this scripture a little bit more clearly uh, to understand what David meant by it. But as we read through this, you recognize that the very last verse, verse 11 there, if you look at it, it says, you will show me the way of life, or if you have the ESV, you have made known to me the path of life. This is David's main point for Psalm 16. You have shown me a pathway, made known to me a path that leads to life. And David's pretty excited about it in Psalm 16. He's writing this song about it. What does this psalm have to do with the resurrection of Jesus? Why did Paul and Peter both refer to this psalm when teaching about the resurrection of Jesus? Well, I think the only good way to answer that question is let's investigate Peter's sermon. We're going to leave Paul alone for this sermon, but let's investigate Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. So I hope your your thumbs aren't going to get too tired, but let's go ahead and flip to Acts chapter 2 in your Bibles. Um, This is Peter preaching a sermon. So if you think about it, this is a sermon about a sermon. I know it's, it's deep. It's like having a dream about having a dream or telling a story about a guy who's telling a story. It's a little confusing. It's deep. Uh, but I believe you guys can follow along. So this is a sermon that Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 22. Some context here is Jesus has been crucified And they thought it was over for three days. The disciples all scattered. They thought it was done. He wasn't the Messiah anymore. He died and he's clearly dead. So he's gone and they panicked and hid. And then on the third day, while they they were in their hiding, Jesus then appeared to them in his risen new body. Um, They talked with him, they ate, they ate with him, they touched his hands and his feet, and then Jesus appeared to over 500 people to talk with them, to prove his resurrection. The disciples all got fired up and passionate that Jesus was alive and he was with them, and then just as Jesus promised, he left them (laughs) and ascended up to heaven. And they all gathered together, not sure what to do. He left, what do we do? And they gather and they start praying. And as they're praying, just like Jesus promised, like a rushing wind, it sounded like a rushing wind filling the whole room. The Holy Spirit came in and filled them. And they were so, again, excited and passionate about the Holy Spirit inside of them. Something was changing. People actually thought they were drunk uh, as they walked out from the room. And there were crowds of people that gathered, thousands of people that were gathered around. And they, they, they thought they were drunk. And Peter's like, we're not drunk. It's still in the morning. Who gets drunk in the morning? And while he's talking with them, the Holy Spirit gives Peter his first sermon. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. And this is unleashes the church today. The first members of the church came out of this sermon as people for the first time started putting their faith and trust in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, believing in the death and the resurrection of Christ. And this is Peter's sermon that he preached to those thousands that were gathered together. He starts his sermon first talking about the prophet Joel and how Joel said in the Old Testament that In the last days, God's going to come and he's going to give dreams and visions to people through his Holy Spirit. And the message of Christ is going to go out and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And after Peter quotes some from Joel, he goes into his sermon. That's where we're going to pick up here in Acts chapter 22. uh, Acts, sorry, chapter 2, verse 22. This is what he says. People of Israel, listen. Listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing miraculous or powerful miracles, wonders, and signs, and through him, as you well know. The point that Peter's making in this unplanned, Holy Spirit led sermon is he's saying, You know who Jesus is. You've seen his signs and his miracles. And most of the people gathered would have either seen or would have heard about the miraculous stuff that Jesus was doing. And he's saying, this is how we know Jesus was the Messiah. God proved it by all these miracles that he was doing. And then he continues with the sermon in verse 23. Look at your Bibles. But God knew what would happen. And he prearranged 
And, this, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. So again, Peter's saying, God knew all this. He prearranged it when Jesus was betrayed by his good friend Judas and backstabbed, turned over to the Roman soldiers. That was something that God knew was going to happen. He had prearranged it to happen. None of this was a surprise to God. This is all part of a miraculous plan that leads to something. Peter continues, with the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. Now, this is somewhat confusing. Why is Peter telling these thousands of people that gathered that you nailed him to a cross and you killed him? Surely, it's somewhat offensive to the crowd, too. We know there's thousands gathered, and we know there's only a few Roman soldiers that actually nailed Jesus' hands and feet to the cross. Why would Peter make that offensive statement to the crowd that you nailed him to the cross and you killed Jesus? I think what Peter is getting at here is that if we would not have sinned, Christ would have not needed to come and die on the cross. It was for our sin, all of our sin. It's kind of the idea of someone's drowning in the water and you jump in and you save them, you pull them out and you're sopping wet and you say, you made me wet, you made me sopping wet. I said, no, you chose to jump in the water. Yeah, but if you wouldn't have been drowning, I never would have jumped. I think that's what Peter's trying to say here. We see it clearly in John 3, 16 and and 17, where he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So it's because of our sin that we needed saving. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's what Peter's trying to point to the crowd. We're the ones who nailed him there. And just to keep us all honest this morning, because I want us to all be honest this morning, because if you're not honest, you don't see your need for a savior. But just to keep us honest this morning, it's gonna involve you raising a hand up, unless you're perfect. But how many in this room have ever sinned in their life? Yeah. So the truth is, is what Peter's saying to that crowd is the same truth that we have to embrace. It was our sin. We nailed Jesus to the cross and we killed him. But that's why he came. And that should weigh heavy on us to understand what Christ went through because of our desperate need for a savior. Peter continues in his sermon in verse 24, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life for death could not keep him in its grip. And this is the exciting news that we celebrate. This is why we gather, this is why we dress up. This is what we celebrate this morning is that God raised Jesus from the dead. He defeated death. Death had a hold on him for three days and then he broke free. His death could not keep him down. And this is the confidence we have that if Christ defeated death and we are in Christ and connected with Christ, then when we die, death will not have a grip on us. But we also, like Christ, will be raised up in heaven and then on earth here. That those of us who give it, has given our faith and trust to Jesus, that he has resurrected us into a new life. We sang the opening song this morning. We sang, I ran out of that grave. What we're talking about is when God called our name, when God opened our eyes to the gospel, we actually ran away from an old life and ran into a new life. A life that was leading to death, now living a life that's leading to life. It's a path of life. Like David mentioned in Psalm 16. I want you to start to see a connection here. In 2 Timothy, we preached this book not too long ago as a church. Paul says very similar things here. He says, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was the plan from the beginning of time to show us his grace through Jesus Christ. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Listen to this. He broke the power of death and illuminated 
a path to life. He illuminated a path, or made known to us a path to life. And that's exactly when Peter decides in the middle of his sermon, led by the Holy Spirit, to start quoting King David in Psalm 16. Look at your Bibles at verse 25 as Peter continues this sermon. He says, King David said this about him. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises and my body rests in hope for he will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave for you have shown me the way of life. Or your ESV translation, you have shown me the path, we have made known to me the path of life, and you fill me with joy in your presence. Does that sound familiar? It's the exact passage we just read when we were all standing together, Psalm 16. Peter knew that David's song was popular, that Psalm 16, people knew those lyrics. They'd, been, they'd sung that song for thousands of years. As he brought to light and said, this is what David, a thousand years ago, was talking about. This is what he meant when he wrote these lyrics. Look at verse 29 of Peter's sermon. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. So he's saying David couldn't have been talking about himself when he said that your holy one will not rot in the grave. But, this is verse 30, but he was a prophet and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. So not only did God resurrect Jesus, but he called it through David a thousand years earlier that a Messiah was gonna come and he was going to die, but his body would not rot in the grave. He would rise to life again. And as David said in Psalm 16, he would show us a pathway to life. Let's continue with the sermon, verse 32. Peter's getting excited at this point in time. He says, God raised Jesus from the dead. And we were all witnesses of this because all the, the disciples and the apostles, they saw Jesus after his resurrection. He said, we're eyewitnesses of this. In verse 33, now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. This is verse 36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. We know what Messiah means. That's the long-awaited Savior. The whole Old Testament talks about everything in the Old Testament foreshadows and shows something's going to happen. And everything in the New Testament of Scriptures is centered around this Messiah that was going to come and save. That was going to show us life. I'm here this morning to let you know, church, that Jesus is the path to life. Jesus is the pathway to life. This is the same life that David was talking about a thousand years earlier and that Peter is preaching about. Go back to Psalm 16. Flip back in your Bible, Psalm 16. Let's see how David describes this pathway of life. Look at your verse 8 of Psalm 16. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. You want to know something about the path of life that Jesus provides? You're not going to be shaken. If you're on the path of life, no matter what storm comes your way, no matter what, no matter what hardship you face, no matter how awful life gets, you will not be shaken for the Lord is with you on this path of life. 
and he will hold you and he will sustain you. How else does David describe this pathway of life? Look at verse 9 of Psalm 16. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice my body rests in safety. You want to know something else about this path of life? This path of life means you will find true joy and contentment and rest. That no matter what life throws at you, if you're walking down this path of life, that you have a reason to show joy and to be joyful. You have a reason to celebrate. And there's something on this path that the world can never take away from you when you're on the path of life and they can never take away your joy and your rest. And look at verse 10. David writes, for, I will not leave, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. The path of life means that your soul will be saved. When you die, your soul is not gonna be left for the dead like everybody else's soul. Your soul will do something unique if you're on the path of life. When you die, it will be risen up to life. Just as the Holy One, which is the Messiah, as David talked about, was risen up from the grave. He did not rot in the grave. We also be raised with Christ. And then look at the last verse in Psalm 16, verse 11. David writes, you have shown me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and pleasures of living with you forevermore. Here's something else. Here's the last thing from the Psalm 16 that we know about this path of life. Eternity is at stake with it. Pleasures of living with God forever. That those who are on the path of life, they will live with God in perfect joy and perfect pleasure and perfectness forever. When Jesus walked on the earth, this is how he said it. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That's what he's talking about, the path to life. I am the path to life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the path of life, and I'm asking you this morning, especially if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, to choose the path of life, to choose Jesus, and you will find joy, and you'll find peace, and you'll find contentment, you'll find purpose, you'll find your creator who will explain why you exist. And you will find a strength that will, won't shake you when the world shakes around you, that stands firm, a rock that you can hold on to. And when you die, you will not be left among the dead, but you'll be rised, raised up to Christ. Look, there's a lot of paths you can choose. And Christians, sometimes for us that we're walking the pathway of life, we're tempted to jump ship and jump on another path. Those temptations, those lures are there. There's a lot of paths that you can make the goal of your life. This is the path that I'm heading through. You can go down the path of wealth. There's a lot of research on that. You can Google it and you can find article after article of 10 ways to be a millionaire, 10 ways to get rich, 10 ways to make wise investments. And you can take your whole life and devote it to, how do I get rich? How do I get wealth? How do I accumulate Stuff for me. But it's pointless. And you'll regret it. And when you die, you can't take any of that with you. And you could choose, well, well, what about the path of fame? I want to leave a legacy. That's what I want to do. I want people to remember me. And I want to be an influencer. And I want to say and do things that thousands gather to listen and hear about or to tune in to my YouTube channel. I wanna be famous. I want people to remember me. And I'm here to tell you that pathway leads to destruction, leads to death. It's pointless, it's a waste of a life. About three generations from now, I don't care how influential you are, about three generations now, at best, you may be in a history book, at best. It won't matter. You can choose the pathway of the American dream. I want a beautiful family. I want a beautiful house. I want to go on nice vacations. I want 
things to be comfortable. I want it to be easy. I want to have just thought through every single detail. So whatever ha- life happens to me, it's ease and it's wonderful. And I'm telling you, that path of the American dream will lead to destruction. It will not be worth it. Don't be lured. All those paths, they lie to you. They promise you to deliver something that they can never deliver. They promise to deliver joy, peace, and contentment, and they all fall short. You know the people I feel the, the baddest for are those who live for that path and actually get there and recognize in person how destructive and meaningless it is. If you look at the suicide rate among our celebrities, it's ridiculous. Among our athletes, it's ridiculous. At least those who don't make it, they can live in some kind of weird thought that, well, maybe I just need to pursue my dream a little bit more. And it gives them a little bit of hope. Oh, but it's all worthless. It's all dumb. It don't matter. Every one of those paths lead to destruction. There's only one path that leads to life. And that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus says it this way. He said, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet you forfeit your own soul? You get everything you want, make all the money, get all the fame, get all the ease, get all the comfort, get the American dream, you get it all, and then you die and you recognize that nothing mattered that you lived for. You wasted your God-given breath. And what mattered, the path of life, you didn't even toy with. You didn't even consider So what do we do? How do we get on the path of life? You don't have to turn there because I'm gonna put it on the screen for you, but I do wanna go back to Peter's sermon in Acts 2. Because Peter gets that question after a sermon. His words pierced their, their hearts and they, they got wide-eyed and they felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and they asked Peter, they said, brothers, they asked the, the apostles standing there, they said, brothers, what do we do? And this is what Peter replied. He said, each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. And then Peter continues preaching for a long time after that. And his main theme for that part of the sermon was, save yourself from this crooked generation. In other words, he's saying the exact same thing that David's saying. Choose the path of life. You live in a crooked and depraved generation. They're going to lie to you. They're going to tell you, this is what brings joy. This is what brings peace. This is what satisfies. This is what good. But it's all lies. They're deceiving you. They're crooked. They just want to get, they want to use you for their own purposes. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few will find it. That's troubling to me. Only a few will find it. The path of life takes humility. We gotta recognize that we're a sinner. And just like Peter told the crowds there, if you wanna enter the pathway of life, you gotta repent of your sins. You gotta look at what you're doing, the way you're living, and not be okay with it. Say, this is wrong. I want what God says. I wanna do what's right. You got, it's offensive. It's an offensive message. The gospel is always offensive. You got to recognize that you're not good enough, that you fall short in your need for a savior. You got to come to terms with that deep down you are not a good person. It goes against the lie that you've been taught in the American dream. Everyone's basically a good person. It's a lie. The truth is this, that deep, dark, down, we are depraved, wretched people. We can mask it. We can pretend like it's not there, but it's like spraying perfume over a corpse. It might smell good, but it's still dead. Let 
But what Christ did on the cross is by putting your faith in Jesus and his death and his resurrection, it means that all of a sudden your death and your sin and all those things that you are doing and is coming towards you, you're forgiven and you're washed clean. That's why it's called the path of life. That when you stand before God, God's not going to hold any sin against you. If you're standing on your own because you went down the path of wealth, you went down the path of fame, you went down the path of the American dream, you're going to have to give account for that. And you're going to recognize it leads to death and destruction. But if you put your faith and trust in Jesus and you follow Jesus down the pathway of life through repenting of your sin, being baptized to publicly show that you're a follower of Christ and devoting your life to following Christ through full of the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, if you choose that path of Jesus, then when you stand before God, not a single one of your sins are held against you because you've been washed clean through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's why this is good news. But you got to choose the path of life. For those who are here, you're Christian, you've been a Christian for a while. You've chosen the path of life. You're doing your best to the power of the Holy Spirit to live it out. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But you're, but you're looking at Jesus and you're moving towards Jesus. And you've asked him to forgive you of your sins and, and you have faith in him. This is my encouragement. It's just don't be fooled by those other paths as the world tries to sell them to you. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. There's lures. There's temptations. Stay strong. Be confident in your faith that Jesus is the only way to life. For those of you that are here and you're like, I don't think I'm choosing the path of Jesus right now. My life isn't pointed at Jesus. I don't think much of Jesus. I don't try to follow Jesus. I'm not studying the word, figuring out how to be obedient to Jesus. I'm just just kind of going to church when I'm supposed to. If that's you, I want to challenge you. That Jesus paid a high price for your soul. You are so loved. And you are so forgiven if you'll just embrace it. And I want to encourage you this morning to choose the pathway of life and that everything else is hopeless and destructive. To give Jesus a chance. Let him show you the joy, the peace, and the presence in his presence that he offers. One of the first things when I walk with new believers as they put their faith and trust in Jesus, you've probably felt this way, you've heard people say this too. One of the first things they say is, I feel a peace in my heart that I've never felt before. That's called the Holy Spirit coming inside of you. And I'm telling you, if you're on any other path, you will regret it. I wanna give you a chance this morning to put your faith and trust in Jesus. I think it would just be a sheer shame to celebrate the resurrection and yet not give people a chance who are gathered here to put their faith and trust in Jesus if you've never done that and to choose the path of life and immediately where you're gonna get death, you're gonna get life and immediately your sins, every sin you've ever done, no matter how bad you are, completely forgiven and are not held against you anymore. And immediately as Jesus as your king, you're gonna have direction in life. You're gonna know how to follow him. You're going to read the word and learn how to be obedient. And and life will make sense. Life will come alive. Life will be lived the way it was meant to be lived. That's why it's called the path of life. So if you are a believer in this room, I just pray as we we bow, or I'm asking as we bow our heads, close our eyes, can you just pray for people in this room right now who have not put their faith and trust in Jesus yet? Be praying that God will be working on their hearts, the Holy Spirit. And if you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus, I'm also asking you just to bow your heads, close your eyes. And if you want to make that decision today, I'll lead you in a prayer right now. And today can be your day of salvation. Today can be the day that you jump off of these destructive paths and enter the path of life. Guaranteed salvation, guaranteed joy, guaranteed that God will be with you through every area of your life. No matter how hard it gets, that he will hold you secure. So let's bow our heads, let's close your eyes. And in your hearts, if you want to repeat after me, you can put your faith and trust in Jesus right now. God, I know I am a sinner. I need you to forgive me. I choose today to trust you, my Savior and Lord. I choose the path of life 
Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising again. Thank you for saving me. I put my trust in you, Jesus, as my Savior and as my King. Amen. You can look up. A couple things I want to say at the end of the sermon here. One is a prayer doesn't save you. But if you meant that in your heart, a prayer is a real good way of expressing it. If you meant that in your heart for the first time, you are saved in this moment. I would love to talk to you. I got some Bibles I'd love to, I'd love to give you a Bible. I'd love to help you get connected to the church here. So if you, for the first time, put your faith and trust in Jesus, there's a lot of people praying for you in this room. If you did that, come talk to me. I'd love to help you on this journey. To everyone who's gathered here this morning, just from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you. Thanks for coming out, prioritizing Jesus. Thanks for singing his praise. Thanks for praying together. Thanks for looking at the word together. And I pray that as you go out from here, as the world tries to throw all these different pathways at you, that you're clear and you're focused and you're saying, nope, I know the path of life. My life is centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you real quick and I'll let you go. God, thank you so much for this group that has gathered. We love you and we praise your name because you're so good. Thanks for your death. Thanks for your resurrection. God, help us to live in that new life, walk in that new life. And not run back to the old, but to live on the path of life. Thank you so much for forgiving us this path of life, to know you and to follow you. We just declare here that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's only through Jesus that we have salvation to the Father. In your name we pray. Amen.